Okay. Thank you, Dr. Malone. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Lord, our God, we pause as we begin this meeting of our hospital board because we are a people in need. Despite the collective sum of our intellect and technology, we face many daunting challenges as we seek to deliver the best care for our community. Grant us courage and perseverance for the challenges we face. We ask for wisdom and direction in light of new opportunities we might undertake to extend the healing ministry of Sarasota Memorial. We pray you bless our earthly efforts to bring comfort and health to the patients entrusted to our care. Strengthen our staff as they pour out their lives in the service of others. And bless this, our hospital board, with insight from heaven above as they guide this great institution that is needed and so depended upon by so many in our community. These things, together we pray. Amen. Join together for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Call the meeting to order of the Sarasota County Public Hospital Board on September 15th. Any citizen desiring to address the hospital board should turn in a speaker card to the board secretary. If the citizen comment pertains to an item on the agenda today, the comment will be heard early in this meeting. Otherwise, it will be heard toward the end. Speakers are asked to limit their comments to five minutes. Vendors, suppliers, or other persons seeking hospital contracts awarded on a competitive basis are reminded that their ability to address the board may be restricted by the terms of the invitation for bid, request for proposal, or other purchasing criteria. <laughs> Lastly, the board has established a claims adjustment review panel comprised of representatives of the board, the medical staff, administration, and legal counsel to review and negotiate the settlement of claims. Accordingly, the board will not entertain comments on or discuss or negotiate <laughs> claims at this meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. I understand we have a motion to amend the orders of the day. Mr. Donegan? Yes, I move to amend the orders of the day to add items 15, capital B, small b, and c the approval of this <coughs> resolution regarding employee status for David Verinder and William Wolchin, and the approval of the SMART plan criteria for the CEO. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying yes. 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 Opposed? The motion carries, thank you. So we'll now approve the amended orders of the day. So move. Second. All those in favor? Second. Yes. Okay. And now we'll approve the minutes of the meeting of August 18th. We have thoroughly approved the change to the orders of the day. <laughs> so do we have a second for the <coughs> minutes? Uh, any discussion or changes to those? All those in favor of the minutes, please indicate by saying yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, thank you very much. And so now we have the pleasure of having Dr. Eugene Pereira, a pain management program, talk about interventional pain management. I understand you will introduce him, Dr. Von Waldner. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, this month, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eugene Pereira. Dr. Pereira attended St. John College in India for his medical training. He completed a residency in anesthesia and a pain management fellowship at West Virginia University Hospitals. Having been published and having presented multiple times, he has served as the director of pain management and the assistant professor of anesthesiology at St. Louis University Hospital. <coughs> Triple boarded in anesthesiology, pain medicine, and hospice and palliative care, 
We are fortunate to have him as a new member of our medical staff. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Pereira as he presents the pain management program. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for that uh, very kind introduction. And uh, in keeping with the uh, flow of this meeting, um, along, I mean, uh, to continue with the uh, prayer that the chaplain uh, so eloquently put forward, um, I, f I am faced with a daunting task every day, and that is to understand and manage uh, pain of various patients that come across uh, my office and uh, in my care. So um, uh, this uh, talk I prepared for another audience, and uh, I thought it was going to be apt to uh, market what I do uh, in this uh, August gathering as well. So. I'm uh, going to present the talk. Uh, some of it has been toned down to uh, uh, meet with the requirements of uh, presentation on this board. So uh, let me uh, uh, run through these slides. Um, these are a framework. And uh, disclaimers, I, all information presented here is in public domain. None of it is copyrighted and uh, uh, held private. There's no bias in product and service. and. Uh, as always, no good deed goes unpunished, so there might be controversy. Uh, so the problem of pain, I mean, we all know and, and have experienced it, and uh, many people have uh, put their heads together to come, with a, uh, come out with a medical definition. The best they could do was to call it an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual potential tissue, tissue damage or described in terms as of such damage, whatever that means. Uh, so basically, it's an emotion or a feeling, but yet we are forced to treat it as a sign. Uh, we all know the push that was uh, put forward in, in the early uh, part of the century where pain was uh, recognized as something that was undertreated, and a lot of patients uh, complained that they were not being cared for appropriately. And so uh, we did what I think is uh, um, an initial good initial step of considering it a a, a fifth vital sign. However, we don't have any means to measure it. Like, uh, for example, we could check your blood pressure by putting a cuff around your arm or check your oxygen by putting a, finger, a clip on your finger. But yet we have to uh, uh, try to communicate uh, with a very difficult uh, language, if, which will be evident in a moment, as to what the patient is feeling and, and how we are going to address it. More often than not, uh, what I see happening is uh, uh, the first responders on the floor, namely the nurses and the uh, floor staff, will do their due diligence and, and uh, to document the patient's pain, which could be anywhere from zero to 100 on a 10-point scale. How that uh, can be, I don't know yet, but people talk about pain in decimal points and stuff like that. And that is translated to the patient's chart, and then um, that's where it stays. And whether the patient gets a good uh, response to that need of theirs remains to be seen. And it's not a standard uh, protocol, and um, that needs to be improved on. Um, so um, this is the, f the faces sign. I mean, it, it's almost insulting to show an educated person the faces sign, but that's what we've decided will be the one that they will see when they are writhing in pain and, um, uh, and ask them what they, what they think about. Now, this was done with the uh, lowest common denominator to help uh, ch children who didn't speak the language. And that's how the faces pain scale came to be. And we have, we love to have this one size fits all in this day of uh, econ economic uh, uh, fragility. So uh, it's difficult to have more, dif uh, more variety in the, in the pain scale. Um, so these are, these are first, uh, first uh, hand opinions of how patients feel when uh, pain is being uh, asked of them. And, uh, um, you, you see the frustration. Um, so, so this is what this is what someone has done, and, and this is out on the street at the pain, a better pain scale, and and uh, there's uh, there might be some untasteful words in there, but uh, um, this is what pain actually appears to most people, and and we are trying to speak across a language that cannot be understood at all. Um, and for, for, long, for a long time, people were wondering what the holy grail of measuring pain would be. And here we have something now. I actually happened to sit in on a talk last week by one of the guys who helped devise that pain scale. 
uh, out of Stanford. And uh, their, their answer to this uh, million dollar question is to uh, bring out a one billion dollar uh, device uh, and say that you need to have everyone put into the functional MRI scanner and certain areas will light up if they're in pain. No. And the bottom line is even that will not tell us how bad the patient feels the pain because if something lights up in my brain, it might be that my pain score is a one versus in someone else's brain, it might be a nine. So uh, we still don't have an answer yet. So I'm just trying to make uh, a small uh, emphasis about, about uh, the conundrum that we have in treating pain. This, this uh, subsequent slide uh, is actually showing that uh, a dead fish was put in the MRI scanner and the results were given out to 100, report, 100 uh, scientists to evaluate it and there was mixed responses. They didn't know the fish was dead, obviously, but uh, to, show that, to show the amount of false positives in pain. Um, so uh, rushing on, um, pain can be defined uh, by means of time as a, as a scale, a temporal definition would be acute and uh, uh, chronic. So acute is a pain that makes us stop doing something that's gonna hurt ourselves, like take our hand out of the fire or not hit our thumb with the hammer anymore because that's a sign the body says, hey, don't hurt me. Um, and uh, it, is used, it is used for the, f uh, the quintessential fight or flight response where you either run away from your tormentor or you stand up and face them. Um, so it, it's a purpose to help you uh, heal in that you won't want to stand on your sprained ankle till it starts healing to a point where you can um, or you see the, seek the medical attention. And it's a warning not to do the same stuff again. So that's why we are more apt to do crazy stuff in childhood usually. Some of us carry that on into our adult years as well. Um, so uh, now we are talking about pain inside the medical setting. And the, the biggest translation of this pain is when someone is going to have surgery. So uh, these are all the uh, chemicals that have been studied to be released at the time the knife first touches the human skin. And you can see there's no dearth of, of uh, chemicals and we still haven't maybe just barely scratched the surface of, uh, of uh, the situation um, right now. And when I used to give this lecture to my uh, anesthesiology residents at the start of their residency, they would all look at this and feel really good about themselves being able to uh, you know, uh, give the patient anesthesia and uh, mitigate that pain. However, uh, the big eye opener was when I told them the only stimulus more sensitive or more uh, traumatic to the patient than the knife was the actual passage of the endotracheal tube down their throat. So, uh, so that was a quite a sobering statement. And so uh, m my simple take home message to that group of people was, here is someone who is uh, you know, scared out of their wits because they're going to have this humongous surgery and they're being questioned by millions of people who uh, uh, they haven't met uh, after a bad night's sleep and being on an empty stomach with acid being secreted in their stomach and getting heartburn and uh, people coming in and jabbing them in all areas of their body and uh, surgeons talking to them and anesthesiologists talking to them in a very official way using high $1 words and above. And uh, the, the one simple thing that I told the residents if they could do that would help them, uh, help the patient uh, a lot would be to you know, hold their hand and reassure them because the one uh, enzyme or one chemical that uh, can, can uh, actually amplify pain a lot is the amount of uh, adrenaline hormone or catecholamines. And if you can reassure someone and allay their fears, the secretion of that is depressed. And uh, that's very rudimentary medicine, but it works. Um, so chronic pain, pain becomes a, a different animal beyond the passage of a certain amount of days. 90 days is what the Department of Florida uh, State calls uh, chronic pain. Uh, there's been ranges from uh, three to six months to 12 years. Uh, but for, folk, uh, for purposes of functionality, working, and uh, being uh, gainfully occupied, 90 days is what the statutes in 2014 say. So chronic non-malignant pain means pain other than the cause due to can caused uh, by cancer that persists beyond the, the time of the injury or the stimulus and last 90 days or longer. So um, basically we have now come, we have come one step closer. We may have a, uh, quite a few steps to go. They found out that the activity in the glial cells, these are cells that have uh, uh, secretory function inside the nerves. Uh, the changes in that is what makes pain chronic. I won't uh, burden you with that. Let's look at numbers. Um, 
There was a May Day report published uh, a few years ago from the Institute of Medicine, which was deputed by the National Institute of Health to uh, check out the burden of chronic pain, and they found out to their shock and dismay that it costs more than all the other chronic diseases which we are now accustomed to living with are put together to treat pain because uh, they are saying that um, you know, close to a trillion dollars a year is required to take care of all the pain needs of this nation. And uh, we are really not just uh, doing anything more than lip service based on those numbers. So um, the question is when primary providers see someone in the office um, uh, with, with pain, or a painful condition. Now keep in mind that even um, angina is chest pain or dyspnea is painful breathing. So everything um, ca that causes a patient to go to their physician, the number one complaint that they go in with is pain. I mean, the next um, complaint could be a discoloration or a tumor, but usually it is a pain that takes them to their doctor's office. And now when should that doctor uh, try to treat it and when um, should they refer to a specialist such as me? Um, they, uh, you have to look at the cause of the pain, the duration, prior therapies, what are the sicknesses the patient has, and what is the motivation of the patient. I will highlight a little of each of those in the, in the coming slides. So treat the cause if possible. Um, so if, if you are in an occupation that requires you to be uh, doing something con constantly that is painful to your body, obviously you will have pain. So if you can avoid that or, or re re-employ that person, I guess this person cannot be re-employed uh, in any other occupation, but uh, then that, that situation will go away. Um, should we go sooner or later? Then that's a, a toss up and it, you have to outweigh the benefits and the risks of uh, sending the patient sooner versus later. So what will happen to their loss of work, loss of function, loss of sleep, loss of family structure? What happens to the people around them? And, and uh, uh, would it be beneficial to keep them with uh, a pain specialist or refer them out to, uh, I mean, keep them with the primary doctor or refer them out to the specialist for more focused and targeted treatment? Um, nowadays, conservative treatments are, are not really beneficial. Uh, physical <laughs> therapy, uh, for example, most patients come and tell me, uh, or at least not lately, but in the past used to come and tell me, every time I went to the therapy place, I was met with by a different therapist who spent 45 minutes of my hour reading my chart and 15 minutes putting on some stickers on me and giving me some electric shocks. So, uh, I mean, uh, we have to make sure that they've had all the therapies uh, before they come in for interventions and they were appropriately used. So, um, you want to make sure that uh, the patient doesn't come to uh, a pain specialist or come back to you feeling like a pin cushion or a sieve with all these injections and surgeries and still say that their pain is not uh, treated because then it would have been not worth it to them or to the community. Um, look at what the motivation of the patient is. Uh, these, some of these slides, uh, they're, not, they're not intended to be political or, or give, you, give you my political bias, but uh, they sounded appropriate at that time. So um, look at the motivation of the person. Do they get benefit from being in chronic pain? Do they get uh, a disability check? Uh, and we have to look at it harshly because uh, uh, although we have to be compassionate with them, the motivation is what will prolong the pain. So um, we, we, are, we are all living in this sea of opioids and opioid controversies in the state. Uh, this used to be called the uh, um, hillbilly heroin express state where Southwest had a flight coming in from the neighboring states for people to come in in the morning and get their prescriptions of OxyContin filled and uh, return the same day back to Kentucky or Tennessee. So uh, lots of, lots of uh, sweeping changes have been made, some of them with unintended consequences that genuine uh, patients are pulled up in that same net as the offenders and they are left in the lurch and in, in pain because uh, uh, we have to look at everyone with that same jaundiced eye uh, that uh, everyone else has caused them to be looked at. So uh, we want to make sure that uh, we start opioids um, uh, judiciously, and if you are planning to send the patient to the pain center, then uh, let the pain center decide what opioids to start, because sometimes, I, uh, and this is real, I see little old ladies with uh, uh, enough fentanyl stickers on their body to knock out an uh, army platoon, and they're sitting there saying that they haven't moved their bowels in six months and they don't have any pain relief, and what am I to do with them now? So, uh, so uh, one has to be cognizant of the, of the person attached to that pain. I mean, uh, we can treat the pain as a symptom, but there's a human being attached to that pain. We have to treat the whole human being. Um, 
This is a very uh, busy slide, except it's the simplest slide I could find about how to treat mild to moderate pain with non-opioid medication uh, um, predominantly. But all of these have are two-edged swords like most things in modern medicine are because we rob Peter to pay Paul and we tear up the people's stomach lining to help them feel a, a, a two-point decrease in their pain score. And so we have to be very cognizant of the swords we, we, we yield because they can slash both ways. Um, so when, when a primary provider refers the patient to the pain center, uh, it, is, it is incumbent on them to, to uh, you know, give the patient realistic expectations because I have patients who come in and say, I was told to come here to get my next prescription and I was told that I would be getting an increase in my medications. Or the other uh, end of the spectrum is I was told that I was going to get a shot in my back today that would take care of my pain and cure me. So both of those are uh, two ends of the spectrum that I cannot uh, um, service on this first visit. I mean, uh, tongue in cheek, sometimes I have asked patients if you had a, a, a referral to the surgeon to have your gallbladder removed, he wouldn't just meet you in the hallway and take you to the surgery room and take out your gallbladder the first time he or she met you because a workup needs to be done to make sure that we are doing the right thing. So um, sometimes patients come in, they all need the treatment. However, there's that new hurdle called uh, pre-authorization from insurance. So we cannot do uh, something for them even though we intend to do it at the soonest possible time. Sometimes patients come in and we're about to do something that will help them, but we find out that we cannot because they are on blood thinners or, or they have allergies to medications. So uh, uh, realistic expectations go a long way in getting good outcomes. Um, uh, helping us know what we are getting into is also very uh, beneficial because we don't go in there and look like uh, you know, interns on the first day of uh, residency because we need to know what's going on with the patient. A good uh, communication with the patient uh, and knowledge of what they are going through will go a long way in empathizing with them and designing the best treatment for them. Uh, in the good old days, everyone with back pain got three of some injection, three, three rounds of some injection and uh, then if they did not benefit from that, they got three rounds of another injection, and it kept going on and on, and then they were sent back, you know, filled up with steroid and steroid-related side effects. Uh, in today's day and age, uh, there's no scientific evidence that everyone must get three of something, and three is not a magic number. And I tell my patients that um, if you go and, and expect three of something, then the physician has a car or a house payment to make. That's why you get three of something. <laughs> So uh, uh, there's no vaccine in pain management. Um, so you, you cannot say, hey, I'm going on a cruise and I used to have back pain. I'm afraid it'll come back again. Can I get a, a tank up or a top up? You know, and that doesn't work that way. <laughs> there have been requests like that from patients, but I mean, um, good education helps uh, mitigate those confusions. Um, I mean, uh, sometimes um, in some pain settings, the patient sees one provider for their medications and one provider for their injections, and the two of them never meet. So the right hand usually does not know what the left hand is doing, and pretty soon the patient has got 12 injections and uh, 20 increases in their medications, and no one knows what's going on. They go back to their primary doctor, and there's no perceived benefit. So it's a wasteful use of uh, limited resources. So there should be proper feedback and communication between providers. Um, still sadly lacking, I see sometimes. Um, to help, to help with the uh, care of the patient. So, um, I mean, if I am a teapot short and stout, I cannot really uh, um, be blamed for uh, having pains in certain parts of my body because of my body habitus, and, uh, and, and no needle may be long enough to reach the depth of my pain. So we really need to, we need to use multidisciplinary therapy uh, to, ha to understand the whole, uh, the whole spectrum of how we can help this patient. I mean, patients come to me all the time smoking two packs a day, and I try to explain to them that nicotine and smoke products uh, dehydrate the water molecules from discs and ligaments, and we are cracking up like old sofa cushions and the stuffing's coming out, and no matter what we uh, throw at them, the damage is being done in a far higher magnitude of, of destruction than we can treat. But the, no one has addressed their smoking uh, cessation issues, or no one has uh, addressed their lack of uh, exercise and sedentary lifestyle issues. Uh, all these need to be addressed, and one person or one injection or one block jock, as they call us sometimes, cannot be the answer to all the painful conditions afflicting humanity. Um, 
A little bit about our pain medicine program. We try to do the best we can with individualized, comprehensive treatment. We are going through a state of flux right now, but we are getting, getting quickly getting back on our feet and, uh, and regrouping and gearing up to, to be the program we once were. Uh, we, are, we are trying to individualize comprehensive treatment. I work with physical therapists, psychologists, uh, dietary uh, nutritionists, um, um, and, and other specialists to help with uh, a, a comprehensive treatment plan for patients with chronic pain. And we use multiple modalities. We are uh, cognizant of uh, all the recent advances that are going on, for uh, example, of late Botox, uh, has been working well for chronic migraine headaches. And uh, uh, the only hurdle there is sometimes insurance will not provide for it, um, or pay for it, and people are now with the new health plans having high copays and deductibles, which they, uh, it's like a, a bridge too far kind of thing. But uh, we try to work within the, uh, the constraints that we have. We work uh, with pains all over the body. I tell patients I treat pain from head to toe, from birth to death. So. Uh, and anywhere in between. So I, I will talk and work with patients and try to uh, provide them with some relief without putting them in harm's way if I can. Um, the pain clinic program uh, is, uh, is really uh, praiseworthy here because it's, uh, it's uh, regulated by the Joint Commission and in compliance with all the legislations uh, brought out by the Florida Board of Health in the state of Florida. So we are within all the parameters that they want a pain clinic to be. Uh, we are JCO accredited. And uh, we follow the pain ordinance from the Sarasota County. And we have uh, very strict background checks on our personnel. We, uh, we, have, we are transparent with everything that goes on. And uh, um, uh, unfortunately, at this time, uh, we do not offer drug detoxification and uh, no suboxone program. I do not write opioids. Um, I mean, I do not write benzodiazepines. Uh, re lately, there was an article that said, um, uh, about 11% of the United States population is on benzodiazepines, and the fact of the matter is you should not be on it uh, for more than three months at a time. And yet we have people uh, on it for years and years, and that predisposes uh, uh, older folk to get into Alzheimer-like situations, uh, and uh, uh, that is going under the radar. Soma used to be a very good muscle relaxer, but that breaks down into a barbiturate, so I don't write Soma. We, we are very strict with the... Uh, Florida Controlled Substance Prescribing Statutes, because I tell my patients my license comes from the DEA, which is a federal uh, body, and even if the state passes certain laws, um, I might be in trouble with the DEA if I contravene their regulations. Um, so I've come to the end of this uh, presentation. Any questions? Are there yes, any sir. questions for Dr. Pereira? Yes, sir. Dr. Pereira, could you differentiate conventional pain management? Sure. Uh, uh, interventional pain management is application of therapies, uh, usually through the, the medium of a needle, uh, localized to where the source of the patient's pain might be found out to be by diagnostic tests. Uh, medication management or non-interventional uh, would be a combination of medications and adjunct therapies, such as physical therapy, exercise, uh, dietary, and psychotherapies. Did I understand you to say interventional was no, it's not necessarily anesthetic. To be honest, the, the mainstay of interventional therapy is the uh, a steroid, corticosteroid, which is used as, a, as an anti-inflammatory. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pereira, for a very informative and entertaining presentation. Thank you for the opportunity. And we move on now to our Excel winner for September, Leslie Radcliffe. Revenue Integrity Analyst in the Revenue Cycle. Leslie, come on up. <laughs> How are you? Good to see you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Leslie is our Excel recipient for the month of September 2014. Uh, she's currently a Revenue Integrity Analyst in the Revenue Cycle um, Department and has been an employee of SMH since December 2005. Leslie, you have to come here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do here is we're going to embarrass you a little bit, and we're going to tell you what your comrades have said about you back here. Okay, and I see them all sitting in the back. <laughs> so blame them for your, these comments. Um, so Leslie is encouraging, uh, patient, and supportive 
uh, are, recur are recurring words in her nomination. She is someone who gives 100% and gets 100%. And so here's the comments from her peers. Leslie executes her job responsibilities at a high level of, of efficiency and is, in, is courageous in her undertaking in a, of particular difficult projects. She is an idea, idea champion and inspires others to s succeed and, ach and achieve. Leslie is an A player committed to optimizing SMH's reimbursement and, and by capturing appropriate charges for delivered services. She recently had the task of reworking our women's and children's service uh, charging system. Her change in that process benefited not only our patients, but the nursing, nursing staff as well. More time spent on patient care, a, a, care a reduction in paperwork and improved reimbursement rates. Leslie's become an unbelievably quiet leader and, and as she has taken on more revenue cycle projects and departments. She has stepped up and trained departmental charging and CCI edit staff with total commitment to making to, meet, to meeting complement um, compliant practices. She has made it a mission to make sure her things are done correctly across all of her assigned departments, and she's truly a leader in making change in this revenue cycle. Leslie has been a pleasant surprise and has grown to become a key player in the revenue cycle division. I only see great things ahead for her. Congratulations. The right one. Yes, I was trying. <laughs> we have this beautiful plaque for you, Leslie. <clears throat> Excel recipient, September 2014. The hospital board and administrative staff of Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System are grateful to all employees who consistently enhance the quality of a patient's stay by making an extra effort in their daily activities. The Excel program is designed to recognize employees who have distinguished themselves by superior performance and attention to others. Individuals recognized are models of excellence who strengthen the quality of patient care and the image of Sarasota Memorial Health Care System in the community. Middle board and administrative staff pleased to present to you, Leslie, the Excel Award for September 2014 in recognition of your demonstrated courteous and caring attitude and contributions toward excellence at Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System. Berender, CEO, and Marguerite Malone. Of the Congratulations. Thank you. Would you like to say <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is a bit overwhelming for me. Um, I am so appreciative of the award, but I'm most appreciative of the opportunities that I've been given over the last nine years to grow. Uh, I think that's one of the great things about our system is that we give people chances to try things new and to learn new things, and uh, as in my case, step very far outside of their comfort zone. Uh, and I'm a big believer that none of that happens successfully without our great leaders that we have here, as well as our great mentors. And Mine is sitting back there, Joni Kratz, uh, who has pretty much uh, led me through the revenue process over the last nine years, and um, you know, she owns this as much as I do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, um, Leslie, we, we, we like to embarrass people more than once. So we're going to take this back from you today, and we're going to recognize you again at Management Council. So I know you you missed it last yeah. time, but you're going to have to come this time, okay? Right. Thank you, and congratulations. Thank you very much. And now we move on to the Excel winner for August, Christine Crosby, RN, the pediatric unit. Come on, Christine. <laughs> okay. Uh, Christine Crosby is our Excel recipient for the month of August 2014. Uh, Christine is currently an RN on our pedi pediatric unit and has been an employee with SMH since August of 2000. Uh, professional, organized, and timely are just a few of the words that describe Christine, and here's some comments from her nomination. So, Christine, where are you? <laughs> All right, you have to come join me on one side or the other. Okay. So here's so we'll embarrass you by your comments that your peers have said about you now too, and I'd worry. I see them over there. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, Christine's a team player. She is a core charge nurse on pediatric unit. Christine is always two steps ahead, going above and beyond for all of her patients and peers. When Christine is in charge of the unit, it runs smoothly. She prioritizes what needs to be completed and communicates this effectively to all staff so we are all on the same page. We all know what is happening from the new emissions to who needs specimens or procedures done in a timely manner. As charge nurse, she is mindful of being thorough and is always searching for ways to improve processes. Christine is a positive role model. She's an excellent critical thinker who is always thinking outside the box. She is supportive of charge change and always supports her peers. Christine on many different occasions offers her help when, when she is caught up with her work. And at the end of her shift, everything is organized and complete, ready for the next shift to pick up and go. She makes sure everyone leaves at the end of the uh, shift together. Congratulations, Christine, and thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Christine, you're the employee of the month for the month of August. The hospital board and administrative staff of Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System are grateful to all employees who consistently enhance the quality of a patient's stay by making an extra effort in their daily activities. The Excel program is designed to recognize employees who have distinguished themselves by superior performance and attention to others. Individuals recognized are models of excellence who strengthen the quality and patient care, uh, patient care and the image of Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System in the community. The hospital board and administrative staff are pleased to present to you, Christine, with the Excel Award of August, recognition of your demonstrated courteous and caring attitude and contribution toward excellence at Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System. By David Berender, Chief Executive Officer, Marguerite Malone, Chairman of the Board. Congratulations. Thank you. I just want to say thank you and that I really love working here and I love working on Pete's and this is truly an honor. Thank you. And now we have a third quarter leadership award. Ms. Eileen Gilbert Droge, Chief Operating Officer, First Physicians Group. Right here, Eileen. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the recipient of Sarasota Memorial's leader, uh, the third quarter, is Eileen Gilbert Droge. Um, Eileen's been a part of SMH since January of 2010. Uh, she's currently the Chief Operating Officer of SMH Physician Services uh, or, and physician, First Physicians Group. Um, Eileen is a well-respected professional who leads by example. She's an excellent leader and a communicator and has exceptional skills. So Eileen, here's, you nervous about what your guys back there said? I, I took some of Charlie's out. Uh, now. <laughs> So here's what your uh, comrades had to say about you. Eileen Gilbert demonstrates leadership by being fiscally and personally responsible at all times. She is dedicated to her work. Since Eileen's arrival, she has been such a positive role model for our group. Her support and encouragement is incredible. She's enthusiastic about new initiatives and she gets things done. Eileen takes the time to make certain that everyone on her team is educated and, and has received the necessary training and information for any project or scenario. She is thoughtful in her responses to her questions and never discounts anyone's questions or opinions. Eileen artfully balances and sometimes balances these sometimes conflicting physician demands with what is required or strategically important to the organization to achieve the best possible outcome. She has the ability to translate complex financial and operational issues into simple, easy to understand concepts. Eileen exemplifies true leadership qualities and is one of those rare institutional decision makers. Regardless of the decision at hand, Eileen will be honest and fair. Her decision may not be the most popular, it may not even be the one you agree with, but, <laughs> but one thing you can be sure it will be fair. I agree, it will always be fair. Um, one area where Eileen excels by her other, other than her outstanding leadership qualities is her skill as a teacher. 
she has constantly demonstrated that she is not only interested to, in furthering her own personal development, but takes an active role in encouraging those around her. She wants everyone to reach their full potential. Eileen personally has held educational sessions for practice administrators to aid them in achieving their MGMA certified medical practice uh, executive designations. She has held budget boot camp meetings to increase the level of skill and expertise of the team in budgeting and finance. She obviously has a deep understanding of what it, makes, uh, what it takes to make a great office. Eileen is a leader with a heart. She demonstrates courage, knowledge, and leadership, but also humility. We thank and congratulate her on this award. Thank you, Eileen. This is the uh, Sarasota Memorial Healthcare Leadership Award. The hospital and administrative staff <clears throat> of Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System are grateful to all leaders who constantly enhance the quality of a patient's stay by making an extra effort in their daily activities. Inherent in that leadership is the ability to enhance employee satisfaction and act as a role model to inspire our staff to become the very best they can. In that role model, you have developed a department that is of benchmark excellence for the entire organization. The leadership program designed to recognize leaders has been distinguished themselves by superior performance and attention to others. Individuals recognized are models of excellence who strengthen the quality and patient care and staff satisfaction and the image of Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System in the community. The hospital board and administrative staff are pleased to present to you, Eileen, with the Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System Leadership Award for the third quarter of 2014 in recognition of your demonstrated leadership abilities and contributions toward excellence at Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System. Signed by David Berender, Chief Executive Officer, and Marguerite Malone, Chairman of the Board. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Um, I'm very humbled and appreciative of the uh, recognition and the um, award. I love what I do, um, and I'm just so grateful that I get to come to work every day and work with amazing staff who are dedicated to providing the best care to our patients in this community. The an awesome leadership team and top tier physicians um, that allow me to do what I do best every day. So I thank all of them. Thank you. And the report of the medical staff, Dr. Cindy Von Waldner, Chief of Staff. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have one action item for the board, and that is the approval of the privileging criteria for total ACL replacement. This has been approved by the Credential Committee and the Medical Executive Committee, which recommends your approval. I move approval of the pri privileging criteria for total ACL replacement as recommended by the Medical Executive Committee. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion or comments? Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying yes. 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 Opposed? Mm. Motion carries. Thank you. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Von Molner. And the auxiliary report, Mr. Robert Dutrell, President. Back in the hand. And 
Thank you very much for your service, both to the hospital and to the board, and we've enjoyed having you, and we'll look forward to seeing you in the future. The Sarasota Memorial Healthcare Foundation, Ms. Alex Quarles, President. Thank you, Madam Chair. A uh, couple of quick comments for you today. One is I want to thank the committee, of one of which is the co-chair, Alex Miller, for the Key to the Cure, which is coming up next month, August, uh, excuse me, October 14th, right? And we're expecting over a thousand people to attend, so I hope if you haven't bought your tickets that you would please make sure that you participate. It's gonna be actually a very unique, wonderful opening, and so thanks, Alex, for your help with that. Um, gala is well underway right now. It's January 24th at the Ritz, and, uh, and in your packet, I or on your page, I left you a yellow sheet of paper, and the reason I did this was because Oftentimes, we only meet three times a year when we make grants, but what you don't see behind that is that on a monthly basis, in any given month, we may get six or eight or 10 requests for grants um, that I can approve that are under $25,000, and out of the $4.4 .4 million that we will have granted to you this, this fiscal year, and that will probably climb because uh, we have a few more weeks left, um, I just wanted to point out to you how much extra takes place just by looking at this sheet uh, of 600 and almost $20,000, $618,000. And I wanted to also share with you, because so much of it goes to education, just a couple of the comments that we've received from some of the nursing staff in the various departments, and I think we've probably touched almost every department in the hospital and probably close to two or 300 nursing staff with these grants to attend converse, you know, conferences and such. Um, one is thank you sincerely for the opportunity to attend the Magnet Program Workshop in Chapel Hill. I love the ma what Magnet does, and it gives us a roadmap and impacts in the pursuits of ex pursuit of excellence. <coughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity to th attend the ANPP, I think, conference. Um, the knowledge I have gained will be very wonderful in improving programs like nursing orientation preceptor class and student liaison. Uh, I won't go through all these, but I've got dozens and dozens of these. Uh, the thank you for allowing me to attend the Association of Nursing Professional Development Conference in Orlando. I was able to meet with the national leaders at the ANPD organization, which has now let m led me to my involvement in a task force. Thank you for the Comprehensive Stroke Care Summit support at seminar in Chicago. I had the opportunity to network with other regional leaders in neuroscience. The list goes on and on, and so one, I want to thank all the staff at Sarasota Memorial for the wonderful work they do because that allows us to do a better job in the community, but also for sharing their experiences so that we can highlight those to the community that has been so generous to us um, in being able to make these grants. But I thought you'd like to see some of the background that you normally wouldn't see um, of what constitutes that. So that concludes my report, unless there's any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now the treasurer's report, Mr. Joe DiVigilio. Okay, uh, we have one item, uh, which is our monthly approval of the bad debt and charity care. In that regard, I move approval of the bad debt and charity care for the month ending August 31st, 2014, in the amount of $12,144,000. Uh, any comments or discussion on the motion and the second? All those in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. That's all we have. Thank you. And now we have the Secretary's report, Mr. Tom Taller. Thank you, Madam Chair. The October board meeting schedule is as follows. On Tuesday, the 7th of October, at 7.30, the Quality Committee will meet. At 8.30, the Mission and Planning. At 10 o'clock, the Audit Committee. And at 11 o'clock, the
the board lunch on October 20th, a Monday, the board will meet at the public board meeting at one o'clock in the afternoon. That's my report, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. We'll move on to operations reports. Mr. Nelson Lane, controller. This is the financial report, the financial highlights for the month of August and also for the 11 months that ended August 31st. Strong uh, inpatient volumes and uh, case mix, especially in the month of August, contributed not only to the, the month but also to the year-to-date revenues. And as such, the uh, revenues were quite a bit higher than both the budget and the prior year. For the year-to-date period, our operating revenues were $536,533,000. Uh, similar to the revenues, the inpatient volumes and the total volumes contributed also to the expenses being uh, significantly over budget, not by as much as the revenues, fortunately. Um, but it did drive both the, uh, the staffing and the salaries and benefits, as well as the supply costs, in particular in the supply costs. The uh, implant costs have been uh, quite a bit higher than what would have been expected because of the types of cases that we've seen in the uh, year-to-date period and in the month. In total, our uh, operating expenses were $510,093,000 for the year-to-date period compared to a budget of $495,140,000, uh, I'm sorry, $495,140,000 and $474,194,000 for the prior year. As a result of the revenues and expenses, looking at the operating income, and I'll remind you that is in a rating agency format, uh, both for the month and the year-to-date period, the operating income was substantially higher than both the budget and the prior year. <coughs> for the uh, month of August, the paid hours for adjusted admission were 148, and for the year-to-date period, 130. The hospital average daily occupancy as a result of those volumes that I had mentioned previously, both the av average daily occupancy and the admissions were higher than what were expected and uh, were budgeted. Uh, looking at the occupancy percentage and occupancy total, inpatient in particular was 355 compared to 332 and 330 for the budget and prior year, respectively. Uh, that represents 6.9% greater than the budget and 7.6% greater than last year for the same period of time. And admissions of 25,365 were uh, quite a bit higher than both the budget and prior year, as you can see in that report, and that represents uh, a little over 8% greater than last year and a little over 9% greater than what was budgeted for admissions. And our length of stay on the bottom section of that uh, chart, the length of stay was slightly less at 4.69 days compared to 4.71 for last year. For the year-to-day period, surgery cases were uh, under the budgeted number in total, but higher than the prior year. But uh, if we look at in inpatients specifically, that is running higher than both the budget and the prior year. We had 6,707 inpatient surgery cases in the 11 months compared to a budget of 6,455 and uh, prior year of 6,254. And births are running quite a bit higher as well. Uh, this 2,832 births represents 9% greater than what was budgeted and 6.8% greater than last year. Outpatient registrations uh, in total of 364,764, while less than budget, still is running 3.2% uh, higher than what we saw last year for the same period of time, the 11 months. And emergency care center registrations, particularly on the main campus, are substantially higher than both the budget and the prior year. Um, that's 9.5% greater than the budget in the main emergency uh, main emergency care center. And our case mix, which represents uh, the types of cases we see, 
is running higher than last year as well. The Medicare case mix index was 1.84, and the uh, case mix for all patients was 1.68, and you can see how that compares to prior years. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Ms. Jan Mock, Chief Nursing Officer. Good afternoon, and as Nelson said, I would like to thank the entire organization for so skillfully handling this wonderful volume that we've seen. Um, not planned for, but we made adjustments and everybody pitched in and we've done a wonderful job of handling that. And we're very <laughs> happy about that increased volume. I would like to just say on to the area of people that as you all know, we completed our Gallup survey and had, had great results as well as great um, participation. And we're now sharing those with um, the staff and the leaders are working with them on action plans to identify those areas of strength that we want to continue to um, make sure that we have in place and then to address any areas of improvement that we might need to improve on in the area where those employees work. So from those results, we take those back to the staff who shared their thoughts and opinions with us, which we're very happy about, and then we can talk about plans for how we make improvements moving forward. So I want to thank all the leaders and the staff for that hard work. Also, like as you see here on the slide, um, we have a new OBGYN physician who joined First Physicians Group, Dr. Eleven, uh, <coughs> Santiago. She's not new to us. She was previously with the Health Department and the OB Hospice Group, and now she's working with First Physicians Group. You already met him. He did a very educational and uh, informative talk. He's uh, a new, Eugene Ferrero is a new anesthesiologist, which you met, who is now seeing patients in three of our four locations um, here on the, uh, not our campus, but now our campus is spread throughout the whole county. So uh, we're very happy to have him. In the laboratory, we formally started the, the new laboratory system implementation. It's a three-phase process and phase one is the most, um, the majority of the portion of the implementation, and that's planned to be completed by the fall of 2015. So the lab people and the IT people are working very hard on that implementation. Very happy, and I hope some of you have seen this, to uh, share with you the slide that shows our new employee health um, that moved from five Northwest to, to, to Waldemere Tower. This is a very beautiful office um, for the employees to go to and um, be treated both for their safety and their um, health issues. And it's also a very nice workspace for the staff who work there. So I think if you ask anyone about this new space, they would say thank you, thank you, thank you. It is a wonderful place to work and a place for our employees to go. And it shows them how important they are to us as an organization. This is a new format. You might have seen it already, but this is a format that we'll be using thanks to input from all of you. And this really has to do with um, what we've talked about in the past, which are core measures, but we've kind of relabeled them to talk about the area of perfect care core measure performance. And what that means is each of these bars indicate all of the categories that are within a core measure and how we're doing on meeting that perfect score. And so you can see here, you've got uh, AMI, and uh, there are seven measures under there. And you can see that we consistently are up, you know, close to the 98th percentile. We had a little dip this last uh, quarter, and it had to do with PCI and the 90 minutes. So we constantly look at each one of those, and we constantly make changes to make sure that we're meeting those requirements. The next one you see here is the heart failure. And you see this is the whole year quarter, so there's first quarter, second quarter, and third quarter, and we're making great pro progress there, and we're looking for consistency, obviously. And there are four measures under heart failure. The next one is pneumonia, which has two measures, and this mainly has to do with the correct antibiotic selection. And uh, you can see because of the low numbers, if we miss just one, you can see what that does to the, to the numbers. The next one is SKIP, and you've all heard a lot about SKIP. 
Um, and uh, there are eight measures. This is the largest one. There are eight measures under this area. We're very pleased to um, see that progress in this last quarter um, where we had 99.1%. Uh, and this is very important to all of us and to our patients. And so um, we're very pleased with all the work that's being done there and to see that progress. The next one is stroke. Um, this is probably our biggest challenge, and it really has to do with documentation. Um, but uh, we're, we're seeing this as an area that we, we are trying to give um, those methods where um, it's automatic that it has to be documented. So we're working with our IT folks. And the next one is VTE prophylaxis. Um, and uh, big focus again here on documentation and uh, working on the uh, apparatuses for the legs that prevent DVT. So I hope this format is much better. It's not as busy. It shows our progress over time for the year. And uh, we're open for any feedback that you have in if you like this format. <coughs> um, the last thing is I'm very pleased to say that out of 10 of our physician practices at First Physician Group, eight of those have obtained their NCQI, which is National Center for Quality Assurance. Um, certification on patient-centered medical home. We have one other that's pending at University Parkway, and we should be hearing any moment. We think we feel very positive that they will also get their uh, certification. And um, we have one other office that uh, is new in the uh, Venice um, bypass area, and they are, will be applying for the new rules and regulations and under the 2014, which is different from the others, and we're looking forward for them receiving their certification also. The last thing I'd like to say is thanks to uh, Alex. She mentioned about the educational sessions that our staff in this organization get to uh, attend and bring back wonderful information to uh, make us the best place that we can be. Um, in October, the first week in October, 18 of our nurses will be going to the, na the annual National Magnet Conference where we will be celebrated and rewarded for our third magnet designation. So we will have you all in our, our thoughts and, and hearts as we're there, and we want to thank the foundation for funding that. And they always learn a great deal there and bring back best practices. So it's a very motivational um, process for our nursing staff to go to, and they always come back with things that we implement, and they usually prioritize those, so you'll be hearing more about that. And that ends my report. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. We have no board reports today, so we'll go on to committee reports, finance committee, Mr. Richard Merritt. Thank you, Madam Chair. The finance committee met on September the 2nd. Um, we had much discussion to begin with on the millage rate, and after a lot of discussion, <laughs> we came to the consensus that we will keep the millage rate at 1.086 due to the lack of Medicaid coverage expansion, Medicaid reimbursement impacts, other budget challenges, and uncertainties in the coming year. And this will be the sixth year in a row that we've held the line on our millage rate of 1.086. And that final meeting is tonight right here at 5.01 p.m. Okay. Uh, next, uh, David Verinder summarized the budget meeting. The fiscal 2015 budget challenges were reviewed, <coughs> excuse me, which includes a 3% merit increase for staff, incremental depreciation, the CMS two midnight rule, the Affordable Care Act, Medicare outpatient and coding adjustments, and Medicaid managed care rates, as well as Medicare hospital acquired conditions penalty program, and a value-based purchasing program. Uh, a lot of challenges in the coming year. Bill Wojan presented a proposal to contribute $5 million, uh, which is being done to facilitate future potential plans. Uh, this donation could help with the startup costs of a proposed medical residency program, as it would be a costly program to start and takes three years to get up and going. Therefore, I move approval of the contribution to the Community mm -hmm. Health Corporation in the amount of $5 million from unrestricted funds as recommended by the Finance Committee. Do we have any discussion or comments? All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying yes. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The motion carries. 
Uh, <coughs> we then had a discussion of our OR efficiency improvements. Jim Young introduced his staff. Jim stated that they had made great accomplishments in the OR in terms of efficiency improvements. A team began looking at high-level operational changes that might be made in the OR in September 2012. Tangible Kaizen outcomes were discussed. These include improved pre-arrival services, cash collections for OR patients, anesthesiologist uh, cha champion daily huddles, which I believe uh, was championed by our chief of staff down there, Cindy, <laughs> which is very good. Uh, measuring re and reporting surgery and block schedule utilization and the implementation of the new surgery information system. And that, and we then we postponed since so we had a lot of discussion on all this. Oh, and then we uh, also read resolutions for uh, Mr. Charles Henning, and recognized him for his 20 years of service on the Finance Committee, and Dr. John Strasser for his four years on the Finance Committee, and we thank them. And that is my report. Thank you very much. So the Human Resources Committee report, Mr. Richard Donegan. Thank you. Human Resources Committee met on uh, September 2nd. Lori Bennett <coughs> discussed in great length the results of the 2014 SMART plan and uh, reviewed with the board, with, excuse me, with the committee, the 2015 proposed plans. So I'd like to propose a motion. I move approval of the SMART plan criteria for the CEO as recommended by the Human Resources Committee. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion or comments? All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying yes. Yes. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Laurie went on and presented amendments to the pension plan and a resolution restoring all benefits to the CEO and CFO as they transition back from to SMH from daycare. I have two motions to present. The first is I move approval of the pension plan amendments as recommended by the Human Resources Committee. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion or comments? All those indicating approval, please do so by saying yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. I move adoption of the resolution providing that, except for otherwise provided in any employment benefit plan or law. David Berender and William Wolfgen will be considered for all purposes to have been acting continuously as employees, officers, and agents of Sarasota Memorial Healthcare Hospital District since their original hire dates as recommended by the Human Resources Committee. Motion and a second. Any comments or discussion? All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying yes. Yes. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end of my report. Thank you. Move on to the Investment Committee, Mr. Joseph DiVirgilio. All right. The Investment Committee uh, met on September 2nd. We don't have any action items. However, we did cover uh, three topics. Um, our investment um, consultant, Tim Sant, updated us on the uh, trans manager transition as of June 30th. Uh, all of the financial moves of uh, reallocating monies to the new investment managers were completed. The second topic we reviewed was we received from Tim Sant our quarterly uh, report on the retirement plan investment performance. And uh, um, we did have a weak uh, quarter. However, um, most of the down was reversed in the month of August. So needless to say, we're back on a, a in decent performance range. And last but not least, Bill Wojan uh, reported on the board designated fund investments, both the enhanced cash and the intermediate fixed income funds, and both are performing uh, in and around the uh, benchmarks. And that's all I have to report. Thank you very much. Mission and Planning Committee, Mr. Greg Carter. The uh, Mission and Planning Committee met on Thursday, September 24th, and we started out with the new rehab facility discussion. Marie DiCarlo reviewed the campus improvement plan, and the team has been very busy over the last few months working on a new rehab facility. 
The general contractor and architectural firm have been chosen. They have been reviewing market data and refining the scope of the project and costs. A business consultant was engaged to look at our market and a market assessment was completed and an overview was presented. The service area was described as primary and secondary areas and Peter Taylor then discussed the boundaries of the service areas. Five-year volume projections were reviewed. Market share data from 2011 to 13 showed a total combined market growth of 15.2%. The current facility was discussed, uh, which includes 34 beds in a private and semi-private mix. It is critical that we change the current facility due to patient expectations, and Maria reviewed then the pro forma assumptions and the budget along with strategies for success. Next, Tom Perigo discussed the initial project approval and initial approval of the $2 million expenditure. He provided a general scope of work and cost estimate. The project scope was reviewed and administration is proposing the smaller building at this time. It will be a four-story building with parking and drop-off drop outpatient services and inpatient floors. Other work to be completed will be the relocation of West Harbor Drive, changes to the central energy plant, including rerouting of utilities to the hospital and demolishing the transformer building. Tom then discussed future growth opportunities on the campus, the new rehab facility site plan and schematics, schematics by floor and the project timeline. Construction of the rehab facility will begin the summer of 2015. At this point, I move approval of $44 million in additional project funding for the new rehabilitation facility to bring the total project budget to $46 million as recommended by the Mission and Planning Committee. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any comments or discussion? If not, all those in favor, please indicate by saying yes. Yes. Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. The next item was the OR redesign and purchase of new DaVinci robot. David Patterson discussed the new OR redesign and new DaVinci equipment for surgery. Limitations of the current robotics rooms were discussed. Dr. Fiorica discussed the room redesign and room turnover, which is hampered by robotic positioning. The designated area was shown Current rooms were shown with the older equipment and proposed rooms were presented. The DaVinci XI components were discussed and David showed a video of the new robot. He discussed evaluation, uh, evaluating rather, a plan to move the DaVinci S to the Cape Surgery Center which will help outpatient procedures and the plan for the other two robots. I move approval of funding in the amount not to exceed $4,350,000 for the renovation of the operating room suite and purchase of the DaVinci XI robot as recommended by the Mission and Planning Committee. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion or comments? Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying yes. Yes. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And that concludes my report, Madam Chair. Thank you. And the Quality Committee, Mr. Robert Strasser. Thank you, Madam Chair. As you know, the Quality Committee is held in closed session. However, I have a motion from the committee. I move approval of systems, organ, and tissue donation policy as recommended by the Quality Committee. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, discussion or comment? All those in favor of the motion, please indicate by saying yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Nothing more, thank you. Thanks. Now we have the President's report, Mr. David Verinder. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm gonna start um, our report, my report this month with our report card uh, and looking at our fiscal year to date, August, um, uh, results on our, our leader report card. So we start in the service pillar. 
and look at H caps. Our goal of, of being at nine uh, at the 50th percent and better. Um, I'm I'm happy to report that we're at seven for the month for the year to date now, which is a little bit up from where we've been. Not quite at goal, but we're making some progress there. On the outpatient um, patient satisfaction, we're at the 83rd percentile, which is uh, pretty much right on top of our our uh, goal of 83rd. Looking at uh, the people pillar, our Gallup employee survey, our grand mean score, uh, which we did a couple months ago, our goal was uh, to be at 4.26, and I'm happy to report that we did exceed that at uh, 4.29. So that'll be the, the final number for the year on that one. Uh, merits on time, we have a goal of hitting 95%. Uh, we're currently a little bit above that at 97%. Moving to the quality pillar, uh, our value-based purchasing, 100% or, or greater of CMS reimbursement. Our goal is to be at 100% or greater of reimbursement. Uh, our current score uh, is at 99.8%, and, and so we're a little bit shy of the 100%, but that is as to a, a final number for the year, so that'll be, that'll be the same number. Uh, organization percent of patient safety readiness. 95% uh, was the goal, and I'm happy to report we exceeded that pretty much all year at 99%. Infection uh, prevention, which is our o combined overall standardiza standardized infection rate, our goal is to be under the 1.0 number. Uh, we are we are in excess of that right now at 1.12, but um, but that is moving down. It was higher than that last month, so we are making some progress there. In the finance pillar, uh, as uh, Nelson Lane had uh, reported, our organizational goal was 5.2%, uh, which is our budget. Uh, and I'm happy to say that, that uh, we've exceeded that by quite a bit at 8.8%. So uh, thanks to Nelson, his team, and Bill Woj and his, well, it's the same team, but you get the point. <laughs> um, in our growth pillar, uh, strategic growth uh, goals are inpatient admissions. Goal was to, uh, our goal in our budget was 25192 and I'm happy to report that we've exceeded that with 27339 And in outpatient registrations, our goal was 812000 uh, and we've not quite gotten to that. We're at 807000 so a little short there. Looking at the detail of um, in service of our, our HCAP numbers, uh, you can see that our fiscal year to date, which is October through August, we're hitting seven out of uh, ten. I'm happy to report in the fourth, the the quarter to date, which would be July and August, we have hit nine out of uh, ten. So for the quarter, we've we've looked fine. We don't um, have uh, September's numbers here to present quite yet, but we'll do so shortly. For the month of um, August and our likelihood of recommending. Um, I think that you can see that we have, we have continued to move more and more departments over to the right. And I'd particularly like to point out this month on uh, wound care, who is in the far uh, right hand uh, column at 99% and they have, uh, have, have had some struggles there and have been in the far left side. So uh, thank you to all the wound care folks and uh, the extra effort that they've made. And we look forward to those others that are in the far left moving over as well. Year to date. Um, you see our numbers. Uh, we're, our goal was uh, 83rd, and, and we're, we're on the 83rd percentile. And you can you can see where where wound care has been has been in the past on the left. So we're going to try to keep them on the right hand side of that now. In the people pillar, um, I'm happy to to report our first physicians group uh, turned 20 this year. And we had a nice celebration for them. And I thank many of our board members who, who were able to attend that night. And it really was a, quite an accomplishment for uh, that group to, to grow and, and, and thrive as much as they have and really, turn, uh, really turned into a very nice celebration. More into the people group. Um, this, this is an annual, fourth annual chili cook-off uh, event that we do. Uh, this year we had 11 per, uh, chefs that prepared, uh, participated in the, the cook-off to raise money for our um, SMH's Heart Walk team. Um, congrats to Nancy uh, McGrew, who took first place. Uh, and then just as a reminder, the Heart Walk uh, 2014 is sat Saturday, September 4, uh, 20th uh, at Payne Park. And the walk begins at 8.30. The activities start at 7.30 in the morning. So look forward to seeing you all up there walking the way. 
Also in people, we, ha we had the opportunity on August 20th to celebrate our health unit coordinators and multi-skilled techs with a luncheon and a photo booth uh, to cap capture their vibrant personalities. A uh, big thank you uh, to the hardworking group uh, for all they do for our patients. I, I know our clinical teams would not be able to do what they do on day to day without them. So don't look too hard at those pictures. <laughs> I saw me in there. I had a mask on though. <laughs> um, next is, uh, I'm sure you've probably all heard Sunco that Suncoast is doing its own uh, view uh, on, on uh, Channel 7. Uh, so SMH emergency medicine physician Joel Gerber uh, was tapped to be a regular medical expert on ABC 7's um, uh, new talk show, Suncoast View, which premieres um, uh, weekdays at 4 o'clock starting next week. Uh, I think Dr. Gerber, Dr. Gerber's first appearance is scheduled for uh, September 18th, uh, so please tune in and uh, see how our, our, our own Sarasota's Dr. Oz does on that. I'm sure he'll appreciate that comment. More people. Uh, last Monday, uh, we were very fortunate to celebrate our corporate volunteers, and we were able to treat them to an ice cream social uh, hosted by uh, SMH and the Healthcare Foundation to show our appreciation for their hard work. Uh, during the past year, our corporate volunteers, including staff, physicians, family members, and friends, provided thousands of hours of service to our community. Uh, it really was a very nice event. I once again appreciate the board members who were able to, to, to go. Um, Alex, I'm sure you would agree that we'd never be able to do at the foundation without these folks on a day-to-day. -day. Yeah, great group. Into quality and safety, uh, there's a, um, um, a men's health forum, a free community health uh, education and screening event. We'll have several presentations are, uh, highlighted by uh, a welcome from the mayor of Sarasota, uh, Willie Shaw. Uh, prostate cancer awareness presentations by uh, Dr. Kaplan, Dr. Uh, Gaplin, uh, screening for and preventing cancer uh, presentation by Dr. Fitch, and a stress management and good nutrition choices by Dr. Merritt. So uh, this is uh, September uh, 27th from 10 to 1 at the Robert L. Taylor Community Center in, in Sarasota. Uh, our bariatric program also uh, had a celebration. Uh, we, we've hit 10 years old there since 2004. Our comprehensive bariatric programs performed more than 550 successful, successful procedures. Bariatric team works closely with patients, primary care physicians before and after surgery to give patients the highest level of individualized care and help ensure uh, future success. Independent research uh, indicates that bariatric uh, surgery helps improve hypertension up to 75%, sleep apnea up to 94%, and type 2 diabetes up to 96%. So thank you all. And then finally, um, if you were paying attention in the news last week, we, we uh, had some news coverage about SMH uh, looking at offering trauma services and just wanted to touch on that real quickly. We're, we're in an evaluation pr process right now where we're working very closely with our medical staff, uh, our, our care teams, and, and certainly the members of this board to determine uh, the necessity for trauma and, and what our capabilities are around that. So more to follow as, as those different groups report back in. So, And that's my report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have nothing on the consent agenda. No public comments. Legal matters, Ms. Carol Ann Kalish. I have no report. Okay. Is there any other business before this board? If not, we are adjourned. Remember the final tax millage and budget hearing at 501 this evening right here. Thank you. Thank you.